Hello, it is just after two o'clock, so I think we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Todd Pattison, and I work as the conservator for the New England Historic Genealogical Society, uh, celebrating our 175th anniversary this year. And uh, today I'll be talking about adhered boards construction, which is a topic that I touch upon in uh, my course on American uh, bookbinding 1819. Hundred uh, it uh, at Rare Book School, so uh, this uh, talk is something that I, I cover the subject in that course, but um, not exactly in the, the same way that I will today. <clears throat> Bookbinding historians tend to group Western Codex bindings into two basic types, based on when the boards are attached to the text block. Books bound in boards have the boards attached prior to applying a covering material, while case bindings are kind of the opposite. The boards are covered before they are attached to the volume. There are a few binding types that fall outside of this narrative. Um, for instance, uh, some parchment bindings are laced cases, meaning that the cover is made off the book and then laced on using the sewing supports. So it's somewhat of a hybrid of the two but the majority of bindings fall into these two categories. Most inboards bindings have laced on boards where the sewing supports run along the outside of the board for a short distance and then pass to the inside through small holes punched or drilled into the board. At this point, they either frayed out on the inside or they come back through different holes to the outside where they are normally cut off flush, uh, marked by the blue arrows. This is the construction of the typical case binding. The text block on the right is placed on the case, which is covered in red cloth. In case binding, the sewing supports do not actively attach the boards. They're only captured between the paste downs and boards during the casing in process. In this particular example, the sewing supports are covered by a spine lining, which extends onto the paste downs and was used to add strength in the hinge area. Adhesive is applied to the paste down and then the case is closed and the book is pressed until dry, which finishes the binding process. Now, many reference sources and bookbinding scholars have linked the introduction of case construction to the development and use of book cloth, speculating that this new covering material needed a new binding structure to be successful. Now, even if this was true, which I'm not willing to admit just yet, it figures that there must have been some transition to case binding rather than a sudden, almost violent shift. Bookbinders were under a lot of pressure to change in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. They faced financial pressure as the rates they were able to charge were somewhat controlled by printers, publishers, and booksellers. And they also sometimes had to deal with a shortage of raw materials, including leather, which forced some publishers and binders to search for new binding styles, including the vellum manor style shown here. Credited to the publisher John Newberry, vellum was used in place of leather for the spine with marbled paper covering the boards. First introduced in the 1760s, Newberry noted in a 1774 advertisement that, quote, the only motive in trying the experiment was to adopt a substitute for leather, end quote. The paste downs and sewing support seen here on this binding seem to suggest that the construction was also different and that these were the first case bindings done on a commercial scale. The books are typically sewn on vellum supports, which are marked by the red arrows instead of linen cords, and their placement under the paste downs has the look of a case binding, as the supports are definitely not laced through the boards. The advertisement also mentioned that if the covers were damaged, they could be new covered for a penny, which would also point to the efficiency of case binding, 
a binder could remove the damaged case, sew on new end sheets, and put on another case. Now this all makes perfect sense until you have the opportunity to examine a damaged copy where the paste down has come away from the board. The text block is on the right, showing that some of the marbling from the covering paper transferred to the adhered side of the paste down. On the left, we see an additional leaf of the end sheet construction that was adhered to the board prior to covering. In the detail of the area marked by the arrow, the vellum, which was lined by a pink paper, clearly goes over this leaf, meaning that the binding is not case construction, although as we clearly saw earlier, the boards are not laced on either. Instead, this is what I call adhered boards construction, as the boards are adhered to the text block as opposed to being laced on. In these images, you can see the method of attachment using a model with adhesive being applied to the outer leaf and sewing supports. And then a board cut to the correct size is pressed down onto the leaf in the proper position. Adhered board bindings are a little more challenging to cover. In a typical laced on boards binding, there's room to turn in the covering material as the boards are only attached at the sewing supports. But with ad adhered boards binding, the board attachment runs along the entire spine length and needs to be split or cut to accommodate the turn in of the covering material as can be seen here. Now this is the book that the model was based on. It has the same look and structure as the Newberry Vellum Manor bindings, but leather is used instead of vellum for the spine. Now, the volume had been damaged by water years ago, lifting the paste down. A previous owner, not realizing the binding was damaged or not caring, put their book plate over the attaching leaf. By making a model, it allowed for a better understanding of the binding construction, and we see that using an attaching leaf and then covering over it was the same way that this book was done. Today's talk is based in part on an article published in volume five of Suave Mechanicals by the Legacy Press and co-authored with Graham Patton, a book conservator at the Boston Athenaeum. In our research, we focused on bookbinding practice in America, and we looked at thousands of bindings to try to track this construction method. And this is basically what we found. Adhered boards construction was widely used. Um, I'm putting here in America, but it was also used in other countries, which I'll show you in a moment. There were actually several ways that you could attach the boards using this structure, not just the one that we've seen so far, although that is uh, the most common. We also found that case binding developed later than most of the literature has said, and Case binding was not adopted because of the introduction of book cloth, and we'll go into that a little more in the second half of the talk. This is a uh, early 17th century binding. Um, obviously, it's not American at all. Uh, and it is here because it also has this type of construction adhered boards. So the boards themselves are uh, wood, and they most likely used a leaf of the end sheet construction to attach the board because they were afraid of drilling through the board and cracking it or causing some damage. By using the uh, adhered leaf, um, they didn't really have to do anything to the board at all and, and worry about those kinds of problems. Now, we don't really know when the earliest adhered boards binding was, and it's probably not something that that can be found out. But we do know that it was certainly being used by the first half of the 17th century. And here is an early 18th century um, Dutch binding. Obviously, it's very heavily tooled. This would be a um, 
a, a very expensive binding. Um, it would have had uh, silver foredge clasps, which are now missing. Um, so I would not expect this to have an adhere boards binding because I guess I would have thought that the binder would have been very traditional in their look at the construction of this based upon the decoration. But here, with the paste down lifted, we can see instead of a book board on the right, we see a piece of paper. And that was the adhering leaf that was used to attach this board. The book board itself would have been um, a little bit darker in color, a little browner or grayer. And you also get a, a sense of the holes in the corner where those silver clasps would have been attached. And just to show you one more country, um, this is German. It is mid 18th century. Um, it also has four edge clasps. Uh, it has uh, almost no decoration on it, no decoration on the spine, uh, and just uh, some blind lines around the edges of the boards. Uh, and when we look at the damage uh, where the paste down is lifted, we can clearly see an attaching leaf. Again, onto a wooden board, um, they might have also been afraid of damaging that board by drilling holes into it and trying to lace it in. And so they use this attaching leaf to do it. So we can see at least three other countries that were using this and three kind of separate time period, early 17th century, early 18th century and mid 18th century. And so now that kind of brings us to America, uh, which is where we focused most of our attention. Um, this, uh, book was probably bound very early in the 19th century as opposed to the 18th century. It obviously has a full gilt spine. It has a decoration to the, to the leather boards uh, with uh, some staining on this, uh, almost some tree calf on that. So again, it's a higher end binding um, from the time period, but this also used adhered boards construction. Uh, Instead of seeing the uh, book board on the left uh, covered with the leather, we're seeing a white sheet of paper, which was the adhering leaf. And right kind of in the center of this image, you also see a little leather corner from where the bookbinder was working, was trimming his corners as he was covering, and somehow this one just got uh, captured on that. Um, I kind of always like to see these little things where we see the hand of the bookbinder and the way they're working. Now, this was used, um, this construction was used uh, widely in America. Uh, so there are four different cities here, New Haven, New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, showing that it's in the major uh, printing uh, centers. In all four of these cases, though, they're only using a stub of the end sheet construction as opposed to a full sheet. And I would say this is more common in America to see um, just a stub being used. Why waste a full sheet of paper when you can get what you need to get from just a, a half sheet? At this point, we haven't really talked about cloth bindings yet. So I'd like to kind of transition into that um, and just show how this structure was also used with cloth. Now, this is a very typical early cloth binding, most early cloth bindings, although certainly not all, used a quarter cloth spine and then paper over the boards. Um, here also a, a paper label. And many people have speculated that the reason that they were using quarter cloth was because of the expense of cloth. This was a new material. Um, in America, it had to be imported from England. We were not producing any of our own cloth at this time period. And so to make this expensive material go further, they used it as a quarter binding and then used a cheaper paper. But we also see the same thing when we look at paper bindings from the late 18th century and the early 19th century in America. And we don't have the same kind of, uh, you know, monetary concerns with using paper. And paper is, you know, fairly cheap uh, in comparison to cloth or leather. And it would make sense as a book binder to use one sheet of paper as opposed to basically three different pieces of paper here where you would need to cover the, the binding on the spine and then cover the front board and 
cover the backboard. It's going to take more time because you're, you're using three pieces of paper. Now you could argue that because this spine is um, titled, because it's printed, that they preferred to use a smaller piece of paper with that printing to more easily line it up on the spine. And I would say that um, is an argument that you could make until you look at the construction of the book. So with the pace down lifted, you can see now that it has an attaching leaf. It's only a partial leaf. Um, and I think this is why it's a uh, paper spine and paper binding as opposed to a full paper binding. It's because we talked a little bit earlier about how it was a little more difficult to cover this uh, because that uh, attachment of the board runs the entire length of the spine. So here, those boards aren't going to flex as much. And so in covering, they only have to worry about that narrow strip of paper instead of a full strip of paper. <clears throat> now, this is a, a full cloth binding with a leather label as opposed to a paper label. And, um, you know, we did talk about how they had a lot of quarter cloth bindings at this time, but they also were using full cloth. So it, it would seem to kind of take away a little bit from the argument that um, this was an economic decision to use um, quarter cloth because they did use full cloth. But one of the things that you might notice if you're looking closely at this particular slide are these uh, kind of lines that you see on the front board and the back board. And those lines are representing the edges of paper that was used on this binding. And people have speculated that they were putting the two boards together with a piece of paper to size it correctly. So if we look at uh, kind of a model of that and kind of get this under, understanding of, of what people were think we're going was going on here. You can see a, a front board on the right, a backboard on the left, and then a piece of paper holding those two together uh, with the spine distance marked out so that it would wrap around the, the book. Um, and the binder would know exactly where to set those boards when he made his case. So people would say, well, this is a case binding. And you'll see many full cloth bindings, especially early full cloth bindings, um, with this same kind of marking on the boards where you're seeing the edge of the paper. Now this is not an early cloth binding, this is 1856. So cloth has really been used for, for more than 30 years at this point. Um, and the other thing that we can definitely say about this binding is that it is not a case binding. If we look at the arrows now, they're pointing at the two sewing supports that were used to lace these boards on. So we know that it couldn't have been a case binding because they wouldn't have been able to lace on the boards after the case was made, except by penetrating through the covering material, which they clearly have not here. So this is also uh, an inboards binding. It's not an adhered boards binding because it's laced on but it does give us some clue as to what's going on with the two bindings that we just saw. And that is the fact that they were adhered boards bindings, they were not case bindings. And if you see this um, kind of waste paper up at the top that the arrow is pointing to, this is the paper that's lining the cloth. It's not being used to attach the boards. Instead, if we look at a close up here, like the cloth, it's going over that attaching leaf. Um, so this was put on after the boards were attached and it wasn't put onto the book, it was put onto the cloth. And there's a very simple reason why it would be put onto the, to the cloth. And that's because, again, these boards don't manipulate very well. So here's another model and here the bookbinder is trying to manipulate that cloth into those slots that were cut. Um, and it's a little difficult to do, especially when you have a kind of a damp, limp piece of cloth because you've just put um, adhesive on it. So if you line it with paper, or if you use a quarter piece of cloth, it's gonna be much easier to handle. The paper will make it stiffer. In the example that we saw earlier with the quarter cloth, you only have to worry about two small pieces of cloth trying to turn in at the head and tail here. 
and then you can work on the paper afterwards, which is pretty simple to do. So I think that's why you see so many uh, quarter cloth bindings, because they're almost always going to be uh, adhered boards bindings and not case bindings. Now here's another full cloth binding. This is from 1838, Philadelphia, again, a major publishing and bookbinding center. This would be what most people would say is a case binding. You know, 1838, it's full cloth, it has to be a case binding. Um, but this is not, it's also adhered boards. Uh, this had later um, end papers that were put on after the boards were, um, you know, the book was damaged and so they used that as a repair. And the red arrow is pointing to the, the uh, cloth turn-in at the top and you can see exactly how close that cloth turn-in is. So here the binder decided to um, cut the cloth very close to make the turn-in easier. And at the bottom, he actually made a mistake and he cut the cloth so close that it would have shown um, underneath the paste down, it wouldn't have covered the board. And so he used a corner from uh, that he had cut off while making the case to just kind of patch that up. Now in some instances, and this is a paper binding, um, that uh, leaf, that attaching leaf has been torn in such a way that it's barely there, which makes them very hard to see. And here we have, um, you know, four other examples of it, two of which are quarter cloth, one is full paper, one is full cloth, where the um, tearing is, is so kind of random that you wouldn't really notice this underneath uh, a paste down once the paste down is down. Sometimes the, the, um, the, the half leaf that goes all the way along, you can notice a little easier. This makes it very difficult to recognize as an adhered boards binding because it will look exactly like a case binding. So this is the first method that we've shown so far is the, uh, I call it a way sheet. Um, I know some other people don't consider that a way sheet because it has a purpose. So we'll just call it a leaf of the end paper construction, either a full leaf or a stub. They also could add a piece of paper, usually sewn in with the end papers to accomplish the same thing. So here is another um, cloth binding. This is English, 1825. Uh, again, paper label. It's what we would expect at this time period on a cloth binding. And this is an adhered boards binding. Even though when you look at it from the um, view of the interior paste down, it just seems like it has a spine lining on it um, that then was captured in between the paste down and the board and everything is fine. This is a case binding. But if we look more closely inside around the, uh, around the rest of the end sheet construction, we can see a little stub of that same piece of paper. It was folded around the end sheets, sewn into the book, and then it was used to attach the boards. Again, it's, it's very subtle. It's very difficult to figure this all out. And without knowing about the adhered boards construction, no one would ever question whether this was a case binding or not. And here's another, um, this is a paper binding from almost the same time period, 1826. This is American, um, which a lot of people think are case bindings at this time period. But um, instead, this is attached again with two pieces of paper. So we see the front board on the left, we see the back board on the right, and you notice that those two pieces of paper don't match up. If it had been something that went across the spine, an extended spine lining that got caught underneath the paste down, you would see either it going at an angle or those two uh, arrows at the head and tail matching up exactly. This was, uh, two independent sheets of paper that were used to attach the boards. Now I've noticed this many, many times um, in books from the early 19th century in America, these stains that um, almost seem roundish um, or oval in many cases, and they always seem to be right here in this position. And this is a third way that um, boards were attached to books. And this is probably the most difficult way to identify an adhered boards binding. They used a spot of animal glue, a protein-based glue, 
centered on, on the pace down near the spine to attach the board. So at that point, the board is only attached where these um, stains are. And you can notice on each one of these uh, books that you have a stain. I've marked them with arrows just so that they're a little bit easier to see. Most of them are round, kind of the general shape of a glue brush. Um, sometimes they're a little more oval, elongated is almost as if they, you know, brushed a little bit and dragged the brush. But each one of these is the way that the board was adhered. Now, once the book was covered, um, then the paste down could either be uh, slightly uh, torn up and put back down, or they could work some adhesive around this. But it, I've seen it too many times to not identify it now. And so here is a paste down from a leather binding, full leather binding, lifted up. And you can see that it's just a, a glob of animal glue, which tends to be brown as opposed to paste, which is going to dry fairly clear, that was used to attach this board, um, covered, and then, uh, then the paste down, the rest of the paste down was put down. And using um, ultraviolet radiation, um, kind of a black light, if you will, the protein in the animal glue uh, fluoresces more. And so you can see the heavy concentration in this area on this book. And also, if you notice at, at kind of the top on uh, this image where uh, the UV radiation is, you can see a little bit of text. And that's from the paper that was used to line this um, cloth in the spine area just to make it easier to, uh, to cover the book. So I think this is probably a good uh, place to break. Um, we've, we've taken up 27 minutes now. And so um, I'm happy to entertain some questions at this point. So this is Ruth Ellen speaking. Todd, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Ruth Ellen. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. I just wanted to check my mic. So um, Laura Item and I will be um, fielding the questions for this first Q&A period. And we'll, in the first Q&A period, we're going to use the chat function. And then um, in the, the final Q&A period, we will use the raised hand function so people can have a chance to ask um, their questions directly to Todd. But our first question is from Catherine Kelly. And she asks, why do you think they use a different adhesive for the spot attachment than in hearing the paste down? Was the animal glue being used for another process at that time? Um, animal glue was certainly something that uh, every binder you would have at that time. And I have, um, I have theorized that the reason that they used animal glue is because it's very quick um, drying it sets up because you use it when it's hot or warm. Um, and so as soon as you put it on, um, place your board down, uh, it's going to cool off very quickly and then and stick kind of right away. And it doesn't add as much moisture to it all. So it's not likely to cockle the paper as much so that you could work very quickly, put the board down, move it aside, put a little pressure on it, and then probably use it within you know half an hour or even possibly sooner than that. So it definitely something that they had in the bindery at the time. So Laura Item, would you like to take the next one? Sure. Um, our next question comes from Zaven, who asks, how would an adhered board construction compare to a German bradle construction? You know, that is a great um, question um, because I think uh, there is a lot of crossover between the two. I think that some uh, bindings that are in the, you know, Burdell or the, you know, the German uh, tradition, uh, also called a Gebrucken Rucken, uh, you know, a broken back binding, were constructed uh, basically the same way. Uh, in terms of attaching the boards. It's just sometimes the boards would then be attached to paper first before they were attached to the book and then covered afterwards. Um, but there are also ways that you can cover uh, the boards and then attach them uh, to the book as well, but you're still attaching them before the spine's done. So it, it's, 
it's a little bit complicated to discuss all the variations of that, but I do think that there are a lot of similarities and that you would find that some of them, you know, certain ways that the technique was done would be adhered boards bindings. Great, thank you, Todd. Our next question is from Jean McGuire. Um, and they ask, how stable is the adhered boards construction compared to others? Well, I think the adhered boards construction is probably just as stable as a case binding. Um, you know, some people would argue that laced on boards would be the most stable because the, the cords that you're using to, to lace the board on uh, would be a little bit stronger and it's going through the board. So it's less likely to pull out where in a case binding and an adhered boards binding you're really just adhering them onto the inside of the board. And so stressing over time, it could, uh, it could pull off. But I think it's at least as stable as a case binding, possibly a little more stable because uh, of that longer attachment of the boards and then a secondary attachment of the paste down. So you have kind of two uh, pieces of paper that are attaching the, the cover to the book. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sophia, who asks, how does this binding construction compare to others in terms of durability? Well, I, th I think that's very similar to the question that was just asked. So I, I, I think it's a very durable structure. Um, any book structure is really um, most susceptible at that joint you know, at that hinge where the book flexes and it operates. So anytime you have a, a, you know, a piece of material that's being asked to move every time you open the book, that's where you're likely to have um, damage happen. So if you have a couple of different layers there, it's probably a little bit more durable. If you have only one layer, you know, one sheet of paper that's attaching the book, um, then that can be problematic. So the spot adhered, um, ad adhered board bindings, um, you're just using one sheet of paper to attach those. So I think those are the most vulnerable of um, the category. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ashley uh, Cataldo from AAS, and she wanted to know if you see adhered boards as a general cost-saving measure, think, and she's thinking of Pickwode's onward and downward um, article, or she's asking if, if there's something else going on in terms of geographical differences, apprenticeship and training by specific binders. Um, I think it's very much in the mode of um, Pickwode's article, Onward and Downward. And uh, that's a great plug for that article. If you've never read that before, um, it really lays out the case for how, you know, binding has kind of been all about cost cutting, um, you know, between 1500 and 1800. And this follows along with that. You can imagine that if you want to lace on the boards, not only do you have to do more board manipulation, you have to, you know, drill those holes or punch those holes into the board, but then you actually have to lace the sewing support on. So it's so much faster to just, you know, take some adhesive and a sheet of paper and attach the board really quickly that way. Now, the boards would have to be cut to the correct size first. Um, which in a lot of the laced on board tradition, they would um, lace the board on and then cut the boards along with the text at the same time period. You could slip the boards down slightly. So there's also possibly some time savings there, but I think the big time saving is you just glue something up, stick the board down and it's done. You don't have to do all that other manipulation of the board. All right. Our next question comes from Kathleen Kelly, who asks, have you seen any description of this process in contemporary bookbinding manuals? Ah, oh, that is a good question. I, I think you get some uh, allusion to it in some of the bookbinding manuals. I, I find that most contemporary bookbinding manuals are a little vague in, in places. Um, I think that was partly on purpose because they, you know, who wanted to write a, a manual that was so specific and so well done that you would create more competitors for yourself? Uh, you know, as Ashley alluded to, it was, it was basically apprentice trained. And so you would, um, 
learn from somebody else. The idea that you would be able to learn from a manual wasn't so easy, but there are some uh, manuals and I can't think of any right off the top of my head or quote you um, uh, verbatim word for word what they say where they do talk about, you know, sticking on a board or attaching a board that I think refers possibly to this, um, to this structure. Thank you. Our next question is from Leonard and he was asking um, whether or binders, whether there were binders using different binding techniques at the same time. Um, yes, and we will, um, we'll get into that in the second half of the talk. Wonderful. I think that this is probably a great time to resume and we hope to return to some of these question, uh, remaining questions at the end. Thank you. All right. Well, to carry on, um, and I use this picture of my cat because the, the cat uh, always, uh, his name is Poe. He's a black cat, which is very fitting, especially for a presentation um, that's uh, coming through Charlottesville, University of Virginia. Um, he's always asking me why he should care about things. You know, he just gives me that look. And so the reason that we should care about this is because it disassociates the introduction of cloth and the introduction of case bindings. And this is a good example. This is a book from 1846. Um, is co-published in both Philadelphia and New York. Uh, it is a publisher's binding. There are multiple copies of this. You can um, possibly find a copy yourself. And we would expect this would clearly be a cloth uh, case binding. But again, if we lift the paste down up, not only do we get a, a really great sense of the color of this cloth when it was originally produced, but we can also see how that cloth goes over the attaching leaf. So we know that this is still an adhered boards binding. Um, I'm gonna say it's, it's a dozen, uh, maybe possibly 15 years after case binding was first introduced into America. And so we wouldn't expect to see this especially with the narrative being that, you know, case binding is faster, case binding is easier, case binding allows you to reorganize the labor in your bindery. And here we see a book even later, this is 1858. This is not cloth, this is leather and paper. Uh, someone could almost make an argument that they were hearkening back to an earlier binding style, um, but the, the American Sunday School Union had, you know, had been putting out books like this for, you know, 25, 30 years, uh, and they put out lots of these books. And they, um, I, I hesitate to say all of them because I haven't looked at every single one, but the ones that I have looked at use this adhered board construction. And you can see that this is a, an attaching leaf um, it's kind of torn at an angle. It's not really a spine lining. It definitely goes up underneath the leather and the paper of the cover. So it was used to attach the board before it was covered. And the reason that I, I'm using this as an example is because of the um, tremendous output from this publisher. So at the top of this uh, thing, they you know naturally advertise that they've put out more than 1,600,000 copies. Now, if case binding really was so revolutionary, time-saving, giving you an ability to change the workflows in your bindery, why would you know, such a prolific publisher still be having their books bound in boards. And I think um, there's probably a reason for that. And it's not just, well, this is how they did books. Uh, I think the reason is there was no reason for them to change. So if nothing was forcing them to change, why should they? In this particular case, they could attach the boards very quickly, almost as quickly as you could attach them using case binding. You just used a little bit of adhesive on that stub and then boom, they're on. And then you know where the board is. You don't have to try to figure out the width of your spine and make it exact, make it all parallel so that when you put it on the book, it would, it would all fit. So I think without some overwhelming reason to change, 
there was no need for a bookbinder to do that. Um, and if you know any bookbinders, um, they tend to be very stubborn. And I think they've always been stubborn. So what would make a bookbinder change? This book uh, was bound by Benjamin Bradley, a kind of a celebrated uh, publisher's binder in Boston in the middle of the 19th century. And this is volume 53 of a 54 volume set that um, Bradley was first binding in 1829 when the first one was issued by Samuel Parker um, with a partner at the time. They eventually split up the business. Bradley stayed in the location, which was in the same exact building as Parker. And he just continued to keep binding these books. Unfortunately, um, he also had a fire in that time period and he had to move. Um, this was after the fire. Uh, you can see the paper label here. The uh, spine of the cloth itself is actually attached to the spine of the text block. And so when you open it up, it goes in with that spine of the text block. And here's the title page. It's um, 1834 on the title page. Bradley's actually binding this in the winter of 1835. So he's finishing this up in kind of February, March of 1835. Uh, the, the text itself was uh, stereotyped, so they made the plates beforehand and they, they weren't able to bind them all in that time period. And he's using this adhered boards style of attachment. Um, you know, some people claim that Bradley was the one who introduced case binding or he was the first publisher's binder, um, the first edition binder. Um, he was clearly still using adhered boards bindings in um, the winter of 1835 as he's finishing this set up. In March of 1835, he's binding six months in a convent. And you can see very different um, decoration on this book. There's no paper label, there's a gold stamped spine. The boards aren't plain, they also have a stamped blind decoration on both boards, um, which are actually signed by the binder down at the bottom. Uh, in that curve at the very bottom, it says B. Bradley uh, binder. Now, these were case bindings. Um, and we can clearly see by um, looking at a damaged copy uh, where it's gotten water damaged, the, the, the two parts, the case and the text block have separated. So we can see the text block on the right. Um, we're seeing the paste down. We're seeing the spine lining that we saw in the one earlier. We could just see the little tips of the, the two sewing supports near the head and tail. Um, and then we see the, the case on the left. Uh, the, the two would have been uh, put together. So Bradley was doing both at the same time. Uh, and he is celebrated for doing these cloth publishers bindings. Um, he also did leather bindings. Uh, he did some adhered board bindings in the 1840s. Um, still, sometimes it, it depends on, on kind of what he was doing, which structure he would use, although his predominant one was, was case binding. And he used also some uh, laced in bindings in the 1850s. Again, he could move back and forth from one to the other, depending upon, I think, mostly the decoration of the binding. So it's really the stamping of the binding that would make a binder go to case binding. And what's always struck me about this book, um, so Bradley first starts to stamp cases in Boston in 1835, um, which may be the first um, instance of people stamping um, cases. The, the stamping machine, you know, was developed or, or cloth stamping was developed in England. It had to make its way here. Bradley probably bought his machine um, near the end of 1834, maybe only at the beginning of 1835. Um, so how does a binder in Northampton get a stamping machine so that he can bind this book? It's always been a mystery to me, uh, which is solved by adhered boards binding. Um, here we see a close up of the title. You can see how it's kind of crooked on the spine. And then there's also another different um, title die stamped on another copy of this same book that I've seen. And I've always wondered that too, why different, two different title dies. And part of it is because 
these were adhered board bindings. They were not case bindings. Here we can clearly see the cloth going over the adhering leaf. In fact, if we lift up the cloth where the arrow is pointing to, you can see that the attaching leaf is the same exact height as the text block. And that's because it would have been cut along with the rest of the text block um, before the board was attached to it. So it, it's an adhered board's binding and yet we have a gold stamped cloth covering it. And I think what the binder did in Northampton was they outsourced the cloth to a Boston binder, bought it from the Boston binder with the stamp already put on it, and then they covered their books with it. And there are other bindings that we look at from the same time period. This is 1834, Boston, again, maybe right at the, uh, the point where you could consider um, having a stamped, uh, gold stamped title on a case. This is not a case, this is an adhered boards. And if we look at a close up of that title on the right, you can see that um, there's something a little off in it. The dimensions between abbots and corner is a little bit too large. Um, the corner and the stone are a little crooked to each other. This was titled by hand by a book binder um, when the cloth was on the book. It's not a case that was stamped beforehand. And if we look at the titling on two other copies of this book, um, again, same book, uh, on the left, we see uh, not a stamped gold title, but a printed gold title. You can see that it has not disturbed the cloth grain at all. And on the right, we see a, um, a black coated paper with gold printing on it. So they were finding other ways to, um, to get gold as their title on this particular book besides stamping with a stamping machine and creating a case binding. All three of these bindings are actually adhered boards bindings, but they're trying to make it look like the newest style of binding, which was a gold titled cloth binding. And this style, this adhered board style, um, is, is used actually throughout the 19th century. Again, as long as a bookbinder didn't have to change and didn't have to go to case binding, there was no real overwhelming need for them to do it. So this book was, um, was produced sometime in the early 1860s, sold as a diary used by this person um, kind of in the middle 1860s. And if we remove the paste down on this, lift this paste down, we can see the adhered boards construction. Um, so it, it really is not something that uh, any covering material changed because you can see that covering material, leather, cloth, paper, vellum, all could be used with this structure. Uh, it's, it's that stamping ability that a binder wanted, which would drive them to case binding. And if they didn't need to stamp it, then they wouldn't do it. So if they were gonna use a paper label, uh, they could still use adhered boards, even though they were using full cloth. So how do you recognize one of these books? Since we've kind of alluded to the fact that they're not that easy to tell from a case binding. And there are really five different things that you should probably look at here. So the first would be the paste downs. Um, if there's anything under the paste down, sometimes you can see that, you can see an edge of something, um, you can feel that. Uh, obviously with the, um, with the Vellum Manor books and the other books that use a full sheet of paper for their attaching leaf, that's the most difficult to really see because there's no edge to it. It's covered up by the um, covering material of the binding. Um, so you're not going to see anything at all. So those really look the most like case bindings, but there are other bindings where you see that attaching leaf, which is torn to a stub. So second would be the end paper construction itself. So looking at the end papers, uh, a lot of end papers were either sewn on or they were tipped on. And so you can look for conjugate leaves and try to figure out where all those conjugates are. You know, have you accounted for every leaf in the end paper construction? And if there's something missing that you can't find, it might be because that was the leaf that was used to attach it. Also, 
damage um, at the joints of a book. They might allow you to see um, something underneath the pace down because you know the, the hardest thing is you've got the pace down there. It's in your way of really seeing this construction. Um, so if there's not an attaching leaf, you might see staining. So that's the fourth thing that you should look for. Is there this telltale kind of oval or roundish staining near the spine of the book, kind of centered on the on the pace down? And what always makes me at least assume that a book is adhered boards and want to be proven differently is if it has a paper title or if the spine is tight to the text block. So let's use these five things and, and see how looking at a book we can tell. So the first thing that we have to really get away from is uh, you know, trying to judge what the binding is based upon the outside. And I think too many scholars have done this in the past and just assumed, oh, if a binding looks like this, then the construction me might be like that. So you're going to assume either two things here. One is that the, the boards were laced on because this is a fairly fancy leather binding. Or if you understand that this is machine stamped, then you're going to assume that it's case binding because how else are you going to stamp this particular covering material? They actually stamp the leather before covering the binding with it. So they do all that decoration beforehand and then the gold titling is done by hand after the book is bound. Now this ridge that we're seeing here, um, you might think, oh, that's an extended spine lining. Many, many case bindings have them. They were trying to put an extra material in there to make that uh, attachment stronger. Um, but if we look closely at this, there's another um, little ridge in there that the arrow on the left is pointing to. And so, sure, one of them is, is going to be an extended spine lining, but the other one is the attaching leaf. And then the arrow on the right hand side is pointing to where the covering material goes over that attaching leaf. And you can see that grain of the covering material um, so perfectly through the paste down, which means it's not obscured by another layer there. So it's clearly underneath the leather, it's not over the top of the leather. So that's you know, kind of what I would look for in terms of layers underneath the paste down. Now, in terms of the, uh, you know, the end sheet construction, you know, what, what's it made out of? How many sheets of paper? Are there folds of paper? Is there something else? I want to go back to this, um, this vellum manor binding, this, you know, kind of Newberry uh, style of binding. And you can see the arrow is pointing to the thread that's in the gutter here. So we have a free fly leaf on the right, we have a paste down on the left, and then the thread is going through the center of that fold and attaching it to the sewing supports. There's also another free fly leaf underneath the one on the right that's part of the end sheet construction, which means there has to be another sheet of paper, another leaf of paper on the left. That's the one that's attaching the board. Once we know about this adhered board construction, then we can count those leaves, look for the conjugates and realize one's missing. And where did it go? And in this case, it was the attaching leaf. Now in another example, um, the arrow is pointing to the, the two um, free fly leaves or blank pages that were torn out of this book. It, you know, it's not uncommon to have blank pieces of paper torn out because, the, you know, paper was somewhat valuable in the, the late 18th century. And so people would use it to write notes on or do something else with. Uh, and so we see uh, that there is a paste down, obviously, and then the attaching leaf that's underneath the paste down. And that's the conjugate for one of the two leaves that has been torn away. So again, we can look at that construction and try to figure out where that other leaf is and what it's doing. And you can also tell by the staining of the leather through the paste down that it's over the top of the one sheet of paper and underneath the other sheet of paper. So damage at this hinge area, you know, if, if the paste down, and I wouldn't um, 
ever encourage anybody to damage a book or to, you know, to poke around in a book and try to see this. But if it just happens to be out there because of damage and it's obvious, then um, you can notice that instead of blank binders board, we're seeing another sheet of paper underneath this damaged paste down with the leather going over it. So this would be adhered board construction. Right below the arrow, you can also see that the sewing support goes right up onto the board. It doesn't ever run outside of the board and get laced through. So if the board's not laced on, there's really only two other choices, case binding for the most part, or this adhered boards binding. So this damage at the hinge areas can allow you to see that. And for spot adhered, um, some, uh, some you just will not be able to tell. The particular end sheet on this paper is very good quality. It, um, it didn't stain based on the adhesive. It got damaged at some point with water and starch paste is more soluble, more readily soluble in, in water than uh, an animal glue is. And so the animal glue part of this paste, uh, of this paste down stuck to the board still, even as the paste down itself was lifted. So you could have an adhered boards binding that was using a spot of adhesive and you would never see any kind of staining from that at all. So that's where you might look at some other elements like, is it a tight back? And so this cracking that you're getting on this spine of this cloth book is the cloth flexing from the tight back being opened. And then you're also, um, you've got a paper label. And so I'm always suspicious of paper labels, although 1832, you're probably not going to have a, a gold stamped label, but still, I see the paper label and I think there's no reason for the binder to use a case binding. Um, so they probably used adhered boards binding. And you can also, you know, just kind of make out the um, lines from the sheet, the, you know, the piece of paper that was used to line the spine in this case to the right and the left of the, of the spine, lining the spine of the cloth to make it easier to cover. Now, even though we think of the adhered boards binding as being a tight back, because the boards are attached, you're applying adhesive to the covering material and then putting that on the book, there's nothing to keep it from attaching to the spine. There were still ways that a binder could get around that if they wanted to have that hollow that would allow the book to open a little better the way you would in a case binding. So this particular binding from 1833 has, um, has detached at the front hinge. And if you look at the bottom part of the spine, you'll notice a kind of almost a folded sheet of paper there. So I'm highlighting it. The arrow is pointing to it. This was a strip of paper that was put onto the cloth after it had the adhesive applied to it, which then got um, folded around when the turn-ins went around, um, you know, the head and tail, and it prevented any of the adhesive from sticking to the spine of the book. So they've made this book have this hollow back or this open back um, where the covering material is not attached to the spine by using a separate piece of paper to block the adhesive in those areas. So even if it does have a hollow spine, if it's not um, stamped in some way, then I would still check it and look for these other points. Um, and then there are bindings that, you know, we'll probably never know. And, and you can't possibly know for certain because you weren't there when they were being manufactured. You know, this has all the hallmarks of an adhered boards binding. Um, we have a tight spine where the covering material is attached to the spine of the text block. It's a quarter paper and paper binding, which again fits that narrative because of the difficulty of turning in the turn-ins. And um, if we do look underneath the paste down, we see an extended spine lining, which again, is consistent with a case binding. But in this case, I think that's how they attach the boards. Um, so instead of wrapping a sheet of uh, a piece of paper around the end sheets, 
and sewing that on. Instead, they've used a spine lining, which was easy enough to put on, and then glued part of the spine lining and put the boards on. This is my, you know, this is my theory on this book. Uh, you could argue the other way that it's just a, you know, case binding and for whatever reason they glued up the spine of the case and attached that as well. Um, it's, it's really not something I think we can 100% prove one way or the other. And, you know, there are going to be definitely many books that fall into that category. And with thousands of book binders working over decades and centuries, there's always going to be strange things that people did that we're going to run across. Um, so we have to look at, you know, what's the common practice? What have, have people mostly been doing? So that's, um, that's my, my talk today. That's the, the Adhered Board's construction. Um, I'm happy to take some more questions. And I just wanted to thank uh, many of the people that that made this happen, you know, first and foremost, Rare Book School, and then my co-author, Graham Patton, Kathy Baker, the owner of the Legacy Press, who, who printed the article, and Julia Miller, the editor of Swab Mechanicals, and then, of course, the New England Historic Genealogical Society um, that's been so wonderful supporting my research and um, letting me get this out here to other people. Great, thank you so much. I just checking, can you hear me, Todd? I can hear you, Ruth Ellen. Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna start with a question from chat and then we'll kind of alternate between raised hand and chat. And so this question was actually asked in the previous Q&A and it's from Jonathan and he'd like to know, what is the largest format book that you've seen employing adhered binding? You know, I have never seen a really, really large book um, with that style of binding. And I don't know if it's just because I haven't um, looked at a lot of large books or if they tended to not do it on something so large. So the, you know, the largest ones that I've, I've seen it on would be record books from more the end of the 19th century, um, which can get pretty big but kind of in the time period where I, I look mostly at, you know, the late 18th century and first half of the 19th century, um, I haven't seen a lot of really big books using that, um, using that kind of construction. Is there anyone who'd like to raise their hand to ask a question? And if not, you can still continue asking questions with the chat. And I'll let uh, Laura Item take the next one. I don't see any raised hands, but I do see um, a question from Cheryl um, who says, asks, were there cost differences? She's working on 19th century Sunday school books, uh, ASSU mostly. By the 1830s, they had reduced prices to 10 cents, although this later rose again. They weren't concerned with profits, so emphasized costs. And she has seen differences of construction between the 1820s and 1870s. So um, is the question really getting to, um you know, the cost savings of a, a structure like this, or um, is there a different question in there? I, I think that the, she's getting to the differences in, in cost savings. Yeah, I, you know, I really don't know that there was much cost savings between doing a case binding and doing this adhered boards binding. I have a feeling that, um, I, and I think ASSU is the American Sunday School Union. So they, their objective was to you know, put out as much material um, to educate people as they could. Uh, if, if you were familiar using adhere boards binding and, and you did this all the time, then that was probably easy for you to do. If you um, were doing case binding and you did that all the time, I'm sure uh, that was also you know, easy for you to do. I don't know that you would save time doing one or the other. Now, obviously the, the decoration that you put on the book, that made a big difference. You couldn't really 
you, well, you could kind of stamp the boards of an adhered board spining, but you can't really stamp the spine. So you'd have to tool that yourself if you were going to, to do that. I think what affected price more in this time period was uh, female labor. You know, the emergence of more and more women working in bindries in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s, uh, to the point where they became the majority of the workforce in large bindries by 1850, at least in some bindries, that really reduced the cost because they were paid, you know, maybe a third of what men were paid if they, if they were lucky to get that. Um, and that's a, you know, a, a talk I'm going to be doing um, in early July with a, another co-author on female labor in, uh, in American bindries. And I think that affected the cost of bindings more than anything else. Thanks, Todd. Our next question is from Jamie. Um, have you seen much variation in the type of wood used for the boards in relationship to paper or cloth covers? You know, I haven't really studied the type of wood very much. Um, you know, beech and oak were the two uh, main woods that were used in Europe, um, you know, in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century. In America, there's a whole class of binding, um, which are generally called scaleboard bindings that um, that might have used different types of wood. I know that there's a uh, there's an article, I believe it's in volume two of Swab Mechanical that uh, talks about the uh, about the wood that was used in those particular bindings, but it's not something I've made a big study on. They wouldn't have used pine or a soft wood, so they would have gone more with a with a hard wood for that. And I haven't seen where you know, they used one type of wood with one structure versus another type of wood for another. It's, it's more what they had at hand, you know, what was local um, than what construction they were doing. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eliza Lentz, uh, whom I'm going to unmute. Hi, Todd and everyone. Hi. Uh, my question is about um, you think adhered boards were sort of analogous to um, text blocks that were covered or put in cases years later, as in you could adhere your boards when the text block came right off the press and then cover them whenever. So storing them in boards would keep them safer. And then it's sort of another quasi-temporary binding. You know, I, I, you know, that's not how I see them at all. Um, I think that it was just uh, the way they attached the boards, although it's an interesting theory that they could have used that as a way to protect the text block until they were ready to cover it. Um, I don't know how often they would have forwarded a bunch of books, you know, and got them to that process um, before doing that. So it, it's possible that they did that sometimes, but I think mostly it was just a way to attach the boards as opposed to being a, you know, a, a temporary thing that then mm -hmm. was finished later. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to see you. Hi, Bradley. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our next question is from a uh, chat. And it's from Catherine Kelly again. Do you have any tips for distinguishing leather or cloth that was stamped before applying to the boards? You know, it can be difficult sometimes to distinguish whether it was done before or after. If it's done after it's attached to the boards, there generally is an impression in the board. And sometimes that impression is so heavy that you'll see a, a mirror of that on the opposite side of the board. So if you look at the paste down, you'll get this little hint of where the decoration was stamped into the board. Um, obviously, if you see damage and there's part of the covering material lifted, um, you'd also see some of uh, this impression that was done into the board, where if there's damage and you see no impression whatsoever into the board, then you know that the uh, material was, was actually stamped or decorated before it was put on. I have seen very few 
cloth bindings where that's the case. Um, when I have found them, it's usually a very, very thin impression in the cloth um, because then the cloth was, uh, it was glued up afterwards. It, it's had some moisture from the adhesive afterwards and so it doesn't hold its shape quite so much. So um, that would probably be the only way to distinguish on the cloth unless you could see some damage and see an impression under the under the board. I think it's unusual that you would have gold on cloth that was done by a stamping machine um, that was not done on a case after the boards were covered. All right, our next question comes from Brian Draper, who asks, regarding pre-ornamental cloth, would they tend to be case binding? Um, hi, Brian, uh, it's good to, good to get your question. I think majority of pre-ornamented bindings were case bindings, but they certainly did um, adhere boards bindings as well. I've never really looked at that category of binding. And so for anyone who's unfamiliar, pre-ornamented cloth, um, there's a wonderful article on that by uh, conservators at the Library Company of Philadelphia. It's where they um, created a decoration on the cloth, very similar to graining before the cloth was then put onto the book. So it's an overall decoration. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's not gold stamping. It's, it's more of an embossing to the cloth. And mostly the design is raised up and some of them are pictorial, some of them are just ornamental. So um, they did that in both ways. I just don't know the percentage uh, to be able to give you that you know, was it 75% were case bindings, the other 25% uh, adhered boards? Uh, I just know that they, they did both. Great, our next question is from Yanling Choi, and they ask, this is the first time I've heard about the spine insert being used as a blocking material to prevent the text box, text block spine from adhering to the covering material. This sounds very similar to a honey hollow. Is there any record, written record of this binding practice? Um, I have never seen any written record of that. Um, and uh, for people who don't know, uh, I, I believe it's Andrew Honey is a, a conservator, um, a book conservator in England. And he has developed a, a couple of different techniques, one of which um, for repairing books is the honey hollow. Um, and I hope I have, <laughs> I hope I have his first name right. So um, I haven't seen where this has been written down um, where you should use that. Um, and again, how many people actually did that? I've, I've, I haven't seen many. It, it might be one of these outliers, uh, but certainly I've seen more than one at this point um, from a, you know different cities. So that makes me think that there was some type of widespread practice. Wonderful. Um, Mitch asks, how did you find so many great books with such neatly lifted paste downs? And is it possible that humidification was used by some past researchers? Not yourselves, surely. <laughs> well, um, it was definitely done by myself. Uh, and I find um, books at uh, used bookstores uh, when I used to be able to go to used bookstores and online. Um, a lot of the material that I'm looking at is, is from this time period where we might consider it the industrialized book. Um, so there were a number of them created. Uh, they unfortunately now a lot of them been, have been digitized and there is less interest in the physical now that people can get the textual information from digital. And so they're relatively, and I'm gonna say relatively inexpensive. And I do acquire ones specifically to do research on the bindings. Um, and I'm, I try to be very careful before I lift a paste down to make sure that there isn't something about that book that would, um, you know, make me not want to do that too. I try to lift the paste down very carefully using humidification so that I can reapply the paste down in such a way that um, it, it would be seamless. Uh, 
Um, you know, I, I do work as a, as a book conservator. And so, um, you know, I'm asked to repair things all the time. And so, uh, you know, I, and, and maybe I'm misguided in this thought and I, again, try to only do it on my own things and very careful what I do it on, but I feel that I can kind of redo the things that I'm lifting here. Um, but, you know, finding some answers to these questions, I think is, is pretty important. Um, and I would never do this with anyone else's books or an institutional um, collection at all. Thank you, Todd. Um, our next question is from Miriam. And they're asking, what other construction techniques or other informational elements might be revealed with Blacklight? Um, well, first, hi, Miriam, how are you? Uh, a lot of times Blacklight is used now in uh, in the digitization process because it can uh, show, um, for instance, palimpsest, things that have been erased that were there. So if some pencil was on there, there might be just enough graphite left to um, fluoresce under the black light. Uh, it usually has to be a fairly strong light. So you don't wanna have that shining on the object for very long. You wouldn't wanna use it with any kind of material that would be, um, very sensitive to light damage, uh, but it can be used with faded um, ink. Um, some adhesives will fluoresce and show up. Uh, paintings conservators use it to try to find evidence of um, earlier in painting or changes to the painting. So it, it has a wide range of use um, because even if you color match something perfectly and get the patina and everything else right, uh, because it's going to be made of a slightly different substance, it's going to fluoresce differently. And so, a, you know, a strong black light is going to show that. All right. Kara Schlesinger has a comment and a question for you. Um, they write, I think I've seen another variant where the end sheet folio is folded far wider than the text block and the folded side of the folio serves as the stub adhered to the board. It's the absence of adhesive between what appeared to be two waste sheets that make me suspect that this was the structure. Have you encountered anything like this? No, I really haven't encountered anything like that. The only thing that, that's somewhat similar, um, but I think it's different from what you're describing is the early um, 18th century uh, heavily tooled um, Dutch binding that I show. And that used an, it used an attaching leaf, but only part of a leaf. And then it filled in with another part of the leaf. And then there were, there were actually two stubs that they used um, before they then put up the, the paste down. And it seemed very complicated to me why you would use so many stubs and, and everything else gluing those up onto the inside. Uh, but maybe it, it um, had something to do with what you're describing in that um, they were used to having this extra material in there. But no, I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't noticed anything like that before, but it sounds interesting. So we have another question from Mitch. Um, that was earlier, um, and they ask, do you feel that the spine stiffener in our modern case structure is a vestige or of the paper lining which made folding the head and tail turn-ins easier on adhered boards? You know, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I don't think so. I think that it probably is more from that, um, you know, Gebrucken Rucken, uh, I believe they call it a zoom, and I'm going to get this horribly mangled, a z z z zoom in papier paper. It's the paper that connects the two boards. So they were using that, um, you know, certainly in 18th century Germany uh, to connect two boards. And I think probably when they started to make case bindings, uh, they would have known about, you know, this idea that you'd want something stiff in the spine because otherwise you're just going to have some loose, you know, cloth there, some loose paper there. You needed something to make it a little bit stiffer. So I, I believe that's probably where the, the spine stiffener came from. 
All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. So Todd, I want to thank you for lending us your time and expertise and that fascinating presentation. And I'd like to thank everyone in our audience for attending. We really appreciate it. We will be posting the recording of this session very soon on our YouTube channel. And we hope to see you in some other RBS online events. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>